proceed to closing statements on behalf of Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Corporate for stock. It's good to talk to you again after all this time. Uh, you folks have been terrific. You are the best part of our justice system. And pretty soon it'll be time for the lawyers to finally stop talking and for you all to speak to us with your verdict. And you have the power here. Nobody gets, nobody gets to decide this case but you, not the lawyers, not the judge, nobody. You decide this case and so you speak to us with your verdict. And you came in here all those weeks ago, uh, and I know many of you didn't want to be on this jury, especially when you heard how long it was going to be. Uh, but, but you said, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I know it's an inconvenience, it's a burden, taking you away from your family, your job, some of you, your lives. But you said, you know what, I can serve in the interest of justice. I can do the hard job uh, and do justice in a case like this. And it's hard to be a big company like this, when you have four really sympathetic ones, really sympathetic, and it wouldn't be human if you didn't feel sympathy for what these people are going through and suffering from cancer. But all those weeks ago, you said you could do that hard job, that you could decide this case without bias, without prejudice, and give even a big company a fair shake, and set sympathy aside. You looked into your hearts and you looked into your conscience, and you told the court, and you told the lawyers, yeah, I, I know it'd be hard, but I can do it. I can hold the plaintiffs to their burden of proof and decide whether they actually prove their case based on the evidence and set sympathy aside. And it's hard in a case like that to do it. And you came in here day after day, sometimes struggling to <coughs> pay attention to the evidence when the lawyers and the witnesses were sometimes boring, right? and served with great patience and with dignity and with grace, even when all of us, the lawyers, were sometimes acting like children. I apologize for my part in that. And we were all proud of you. And you should be proud of yourselves, and our community members should be thankful to your service in the interest of justice. And if, if there was anywhere that even a big company could get a fair shake in a case where you have the most sympathetic plaintiffs, it was jurors like you who said you could do justice, decide this case just based on the evidence, even if it's hard, even if it's hard. And it's easy to make the big company a villain, right, in a, in a lawsuit story who cares about, you know, big companies. And the, and the plaintiffs would like you to think that J&J &J is just a big, faceless corporation. But then you saw they put the names on that easel of all the people at J&J &J, whose decisions they complain about here. And then you saw Dr. Hopkins, who's head of product safety for Tal, come in here and testify. You saw Dr. Nicholson, uh, the doctor they had on video, um, who talked uh, about some of the issues in the case. Dr. Musco, the burn nurse, who they also deposed. The people who they complain about they allege did the worst kind of things. I mean, they've alleged that these, these people hurt babies, hurt people on purpose. If they knew that there was asbestos in the product and they continued to sell it, they've accused them of being monsters and killers. Liars and cheaters, the plaintiff's sort of said in the opening statement. People that have babies themselves, some of them grandbabies. You don't just drop your kids off for school one day. Some of them, like all of us, maybe help out at PTA, coach sports teams, volunteer work. You don't do that and then just go to work and decide to be monsters and killers. It doesn't make any sense. And you don't stay in business as long as J&J &J has by doing the kinds of things they engage. And maybe some of you saw what was going on in the beginning. Because I submit to you, if you view the evidence through the lens of your common sense, to see the difference between science and truth and facts in the real world and lawsuit fiction. Stories crafted by well-traveled, well-paid, multi-million dollar experts and the lawyers who hire them again and again to try to win lawsuits for money. 
And I submit to you that the crafted lawsuit story doesn't stand up to the evidence, to the truth, to the facts. You saw in the beginning of the case where Dr. Longo was on the stand, Mr. Panettiere talked about banned asbestos products. Remember that? That there was asbestos in gaskets and brake pads and wall mud and insulation and other products. And then you heard that Dr. Moline, their medical expert, Dr. Longo, their testing expert, Dr. Brody, their animal studies expert, Dr. Maddox, their pathologist, that all of those experts had testified again and again and again for plaintiff's lawyers in asbestos cases like this. Now these products are banned. And they had made millions. You heard, and the judge is going to give you an instruction that you can consider the amount of money experts have been paid in deciding whether to believe them or not, in deciding their credibility. And all of these experts have made millions and millions of dollars testifying again and again for plaintiff's lawyers in asbestos products for money. And those products are now banned. And they came up with a new target, right? Keep the money train going, these experts. Dr. Longo, over $30 million. Dr. Moline, over $3 million. Dr. Maddox, over $5 million. Dr. Brody, millions. Why all of a sudden, after 125 years, baby powder's been on the market? Why all of a sudden? J and J, and they talked about the lawsuits, right? You've heard about the lawsuits since 2017. They've been filing lawsuit after lawsuit against J and J. They get juries to believe that there's asbestos in baby powder, a money train that goes on for a long time, right? A lot of people use baby powder. And what do they do to try to create a lawsuit story? They resurrect, they resurrect it and are repackaging, and I submit to you trying to resell an issue that was all over the news in the 1970s, that was investigated to death by the best third-party experts in the world, that the FDA investigated and concluded there was nothing there, that there was no truth to this. Fifty years ago, this was investigated and put to bed. Why all of a sudden now? Let's resurrect it. Maybe we can get juries to believe it. If we yell asbestos, asbestos, asbestos enough in a courtroom, maybe we can scare juries into believing it's true, even without the evidence, even without the science. Because asbestos is scary. A lot of you, when we interviewed you, uh, and jury such knew about asbestos and knew how bad it would be, because, and they know that. Maybe we can scare jurors into believing that there's truth to this. Maybe they can convince some juries. Folks here are not that naive and not that gullible. This jury is going to ask some very sophisticated, very hard questions. And maybe some of you saw what was going on. You can tell the difference between the lawsuit fiction and the science and the evidence in the real world. And who do they bring as the ringleader for their lawsuit story? The $31 million man. Remember he said, oh, I didn't make $31 million. My lab did. But then you heard he owns 75% of the lab, right? And he has testified 2,000 to 3,000 times in lawsuits. 90, 95% of his work is for plaintiff's lawyers and asbestos lawsuits. He testifies every week. Going from courtroom to courtroom, helping plaintiff's lawyers, mostly plaintiff's lawyers, try to win lawsuits for money. He's listed by every plaintiff's lawyer in the country. Why do you think that is? Even if they don't ask him, they put him down. You think he's a sure thing? You heard he didn't even test the product. And when you think about the evidence in this case, ask yourself, why didn't the plaintiff's lawyer bring me one expert who actually tested the final product? They paid Dr. Longo a lot of money. They paid, remember Dr. Compton, the younger guy, testing expert, they paid him a lot of money. Dr. Weber, the guy that used to work in the New York Department of Public Health, they paid him a lot of money. All three testing experts capable of testing. Not one of them did they have tested baby powder or the shower the shower. They have to burn the proof. Why didn't they bring in a testing expert that actually tested the product? He was just a testifier. They didn't bring any of the people 
from his lab who actually tested the product. And I'm going to show you that. Then you heard from Dr. Wong who got hired in this litigation in 2017 or so, when they first started suing J&J. He went from jury to jury, courthouse to courthouse, and depositions as well. And he raised his hand under oath, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. I have never tested talcum powder before this litigation. First time. Never did. And then you heard, that was not the truth at all. He had tested it several times before. In fact, he had to admit, when they were suing brake pads and gaskets and other things, and he wanted to say it wasn't a talcum powder, it was a brake pads, he said, oh, asbestos and cosmetic talcum. That's an urban legend, a myth, a story, a fairy tale. Like Jimmy Hoppa under the Meadowlands. Like ghosts, like vampires. Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. The notion of asbestos and talcum powder he said it was a myth, a story. And then he saw his prior testimony. He was asked in 2002 under oath, the top of powder that was used on babies, did some of that contain asbestos? We've looked. We've not found it. Must be the red pads. You had sworn in 2002 that you had tested top of powder used on babies and didn't find asbestos. Answer, that's what it states. 2003, have you ever found any asbestos at all in talc used for cosmetic purposes? No, I have not. He tested with the most sophisticated testing, TEM, the super duper microscope, and the polarized light microscope. And he was trying to blame other asbestos products, like brake pads and insulation. There was no asbestos in cosmetic talc. And then, I think Mr. Panettiere asked him, oh, that was thousands of samples ago, so it's easy to forget. Is it easy to forget that you swore again and again? That you never tested cosmetic talc before? Then you saw another thing about Dr. Longo. Depending on who hires him, he says something different from lawsuit to lawsuit. When he was representing a cement company being sued because a worker had mixed a cement that had asbestos in it, and the, the guy had inhaled his these asbestos fibers day after day after day at work for years. He said, that was only trace. That wouldn't give you significant exposure, right? He's saying the exact opposite thing here. He's claiming he found asbestos in top of powder, but at trace levels, like 17 millions of 1%, 57, 10 millions of 1%, 2.4 thousands of 1%, exact opposite. And they say now it's significant exposure, that, that trace amount, which is the exact opposite of what he said that also. The truth shouldn't change depending on this harm. He also said, remember uh, Scott's fertilizer? He was working for the defendant in that lawsuit. And I asked him, well, aren't you concerned that there's asbestos in fertilizers? Fertilizer and babies and puppies and kids running around lawns? And he testified in that litigation, no, XRD, the X-ray, and the polarized light microscopy, that was the accepted standard method. Nobody was doing TEM at the time, right? That's what he said. And then he criticizes j and even though we did way more than that. Now he's saying, oh, no, that's, even the TEM, that's not enough. So you should have concentrated and talk, talk to you about that. Truth shouldn't change depending on who's paying you and who you're suing. Before being hired by Jane Day, you said no asbestos in cosmetic health, urban legend. Now, oh yeah, cosmetic hired to sue Jane Day. Flip flop, cosmetic health became asbestos. No asbestos, he swore. I tested it with TEM. No asbestos in top of powder, you know, babies. Baby powder contains asbestos, he swears now. Trace levels of asbestos, not a significant exposure. Saying the exact opposite thing, depending on who's paying you. He did not use concentration when testing cosmetic talc when he did it in 2002 and 2003, even though he said the heavy liquid density concentration has been around forever. Even though Dr. Blount's paper had been published in the peer-reviewed literature talking about heavy liquid concentration for 10 years, 
okay to use it because nobody used it. TDM was the most sophisticated method. You didn't have to concentrate when you had the super duper mic microscope that went down millions and millions of a percent, saying the exact opposite thing now in private room. Said the PLM and XRD, the polarized light microscope, and the X-ray was enough. Scott, oh no, no, J and J has to be even more than TDM. The opposite. The truth shouldn't change. The truth should stay the same. It shouldn't change depending on who, who's paying it. And then he acknowledged he was just here testifying. He didn't look through any microscope. He didn't look at a single, single sample of Johnson's baby powder. Or shower to shower to, sh to talk about how he found asbestos. He sat up here, and you folks watched him, and he looked at pictures that other people took. He said, Oh, yeah, that's asbestos, that's asbestos, that's asbestos. Why didn't they bring you the people that actually did the testing? They have the burden of proof. Not a single expert. They brought three, and not one of them who tested. That's the expert who didn't test. He was, about. he was good, right? He could explain his way out of anything. He could convince you it was pouring down rain on the clearest day of the year, right? Maybe he could convince some juries. Maybe not this uh, And then he saw she didn't do it here. Right? She didn't, she didn't interview a single plaintiff, a single one of the four, before she concluded. J and J is the cause. I J and J is the cause. In fact, you saw that the plaintiffs lawyers filed these four lawsuits saying J and J baby powder and for Ms. McNeil shower to shower and baby powder was the cause of their mesothelioma before they even talked to her. She said, oh, she was asked, but the truth is in all of these cases, Plaintiffs have filed their complaints months before alleging J and J caused their cancer. Months before you were even sent the information about the case, and she said, "Yeah, that appears to be the case here." They already sued saying it was J and J before they even talked to her. And then Dr. Moline said, "Yep, J and J is the cause." Rubber stamping the complaint without even talking to a single plaintiff. She, you can look at this. She said they have none of them, not one of the plaintiffs, have any evidence of biological exposure, no biomarkers. That's their own expert. Their only expert on medical causation has admitted, and we'll look at it, that not one of the plaintiffs have any trace of asbestos exposure in their lungs, in their tissue, on their x rays. And then she didn't even interview them before she included in her report, yes. J and J is the cause. She examined and interviewed Mr. Gordon after she already concluded it was J and J. And then right before this trial started, she talked to Mr. Etheridge for about 30 minutes after she had issued her report two years ago saying J and J is the cause. And she can still never talk to or interview Ms. McNeil or Mr. Ronick, even though she said that's the most important. science and medicine in the real world, the lawsuit fiction, the lawsuit story. And then you heard that Dr. Moline, in her real world medical practice, where she sees patients, not lawsuits, she never <coughs> once has determined that talcum powder was the cause of their music failure. Never. She only started doing that in lawsuits after being hired by plaintiff's lawyers. Yes. And you remember this testimony, Mr. Maven, famous lawyer here, actually put Dr. Moline on the witness stand a couple of years ago, four, four or five years ago, in this courthouse. And that's when they were trying to blame a paint company who had uh, dust uh, in the paint uh, that they alleged had asbestos in it. And she was asked by Mr. Maven, isn't it important to look at the Miller and Minor epidemiology in determining causation? And Dr. Moline, you remember, testified, it's the most important thing. The Miller and Minor epidemiology is the best evidence. Look at the people with the highest exposure. That was her testimony a few years ago when they were suing 
against a paint company. Now she goes, oh, no, 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 no. Sue against somebody else, Miller and Meyer, that's the epidemiology, not good. She testified in that case, where Mr. Hayden put her on stand, that the very studies that J and J relies on here, the Italian and Vermont epidemiology studies, the very studies that J and J relies on here were the best evidence and they showed no increased risk of mesothelioma. Those studies haven't changed. Same studies. She had no criticisms of them then. In fact, she said they were the best evidence. She's changed 180 degrees. The truth shouldn't change based on what you're saying. The studies haven't changed. <coughs> and then Dr. Weber. Remember Dr. Weber? He was the New York public health uh, official. He used to be a public health official in New York. Now he's not. And now he's acknowledged 100% of his earned income comes from plant stores, suing in asbestos losses, 100%. And Dr. Weber said yes to Mr. Maiman's questions over 200 times. And he asked him, yes, 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 and yes. Another testing expert who didn't test any products. And you remember, and actually he was the most qualified of all the tech. He, he went around certifying labs, he was a, uh, a well-qualified testing expert. And Mr. Green said, oh, you were tired. That's why you didn't send anything to you. And he said, oh, no, I, could I have access to labs. I could have tested if you sent me it. He could have. They didn't want to risk it. They had Dr. Longo, the sure thing. They were going to chance Dr. Weber not, not saying, oh, yes, there's a test. Why didn't they have him test? And when Dr. Weber was a public health official, he said the exact opposite thing than what he told you viewers here. He actually agreed with J&J. &J. When he was an official trying to protect the public health, here's what he said. While a particle may well be defined as a fiber when it has the three to one ratio, it may not be an asbestos fiber. Just because it's three to one, he said, that doesn't mean it's asbestos necessarily. That's the exact thing that J&J &J has been saying here. That's what Dr. Atanus was talking to you about. Just because it's got the same length doesn't mean because we've got the good rocks and the bad rocks. And they don't like me saying good rocks and bad rocks, but the government, and we'll look at it, does make a distinction between the ones that are harmful and the ones that are not. And Dr. Weber agreed with that when he was trying to protect the public health. He also said, and, and remember we talked some about, and Dr. Atanus talked about cleavage fragments, and that's when you crush up the good rocks. You know, if you're milling and mining, and there's this, and there's this, uh, uh, and all of these that are at the trace levels are invisible. If there's this uh, almost unmeasurable trace amount of cleavage fragment because it got mushed up, you can have one of these. And you've heard from Dr. Tanis, these rocks, I mean, these are ubiquitous. All of us are, are breathing these all, all the time. This, these are ubiquitous in the Earth's crust, these good rocks, uh, because the overwhelming majority of uh, rocks are not asbestos rocks. Uh, and Dr. Weber said that when you crush up these good rocks, cleavage fragments are not considered hazardous by many. The exact opposite thing that he came in here and claimed now. <coughs> Now that he's testifying as a paid expert for plant source, he's changed his mind. Okay. The truth shouldn't change depending on who's paying him. And I asked him, do you have any science? Do you have any studies? Do you have anything that made you change your mind? He couldn't come up with something. The plaintiff's lawyers, after he couldn't come up with it, said, oh, oh, you remember that California, the California EPA Region 9 thing that had to do with that dirt in California, some dirt in uh, Colorado? that there was an uh, issue whether it had asbestos, and they said something about cleavage fragments uh, in there. But then you heard that the big EPA, the United States Geological Service, looked at that and said cleavage fragments were not. And Dr. Weber said the same thing when he was trying to protect public health. <clears throat> so before he started being paid and earning all of his earned income from plaintiff's lawyers, he agreed just because it's three to one doesn't mean it's asbestos. Oh, now it is. Cleavage fragments weren't hazardous. 
Oh, well, now they are, without any studies. <coughs> Never, oh, and he was a testing expert who actually published a testing standard in 2014, including how to test for tau. There's nothing about heavy liquid concentration separation. Another story he's come up with after he left the public health. Now he's saying, oh, we should concentrate. He published a testing standard, but he didn't say that at all. Again, ask yourselves, what's going on here? Why is things so different? Something is barking at me over here. I can't think Thank you. Um, Dr. Compton, another plaintiff's expert, testified with plaintiff's lawyers over 200 times, never testified for defense. Another expert who's been well traveled and testified against the break pads and the insulation. Uh, and another testing expert who didn't test final product, he tested ore. But you heard J&J did exploratory sampling to see what ore to use. So you have to test the final product to see if there's asbestos. Why didn't he? He could have. Again, why did they have three testing experts and not one of them tested the final product? And Dr. Compton was asked how much money he made. He couldn't tell you. Maybe it was too much to count. Who knows? Uh, and then, so what else did they do to come up with the lawsuit story? Well, J&J produced millions and millions of documents in this litigation, some of them going back to the 40s and 50s. And they selected out a few, and I submit to you, they showed you one line, cherry picked that line without showing you the rest. Showed you one document without showing you the document that makes clear uh, what the story really is. I mean, it's easy to manufacture. Uh, imagine someone picking out uh, anything you've said over you know, 20 or 30 years and just starting one piece of it, and not the rest, not the whole story. And I'm going to show you some examples of what they do here. And they kept talking about company documents. You didn't see the company documents. The company documents don't support their case. The company documents have been, as you heard, been on J&J's website for the public to see uh, for a year or so. The company documents, their, their most challenging part of this case is the company documents say again and again that by TEM testing, Polaroid's light microscopy, x-ray diffraction, Test result after test result from the best labs in the world, no asbestos in J&J. Unless you spin and cherry pick and try to mislead based on what you're showing and what you're not. And so, it's part of the lawsuit story. We talked about how they are resurrecting this issue that the FDA and other investigators put to bed. These two New York scientists, Dr. Lewin and Dr. Langer, sounded the alarm claiming they found asbestos in baby powder back in the early 70s, which I was sure. But then you saw, what did J&B do? They didn't say, oh, no way. There's no asbestos. That's garbage. They said, oh, my God. And they sent their samples. They sent samples out, including Dr. Lewin's samples, to the best experts in the world. MIT, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Colorado School of Mines, Carnegie Mellon. University of Cardiff, the best test, Macron, the best testing lab in the world. Ask yourself, are they all part of the conspiracy? Is MIT and Princeton all saying, oh yeah, we're going to hide the fact that there's asbestos in baby powder? It just doesn't make sense. The best experts in the world, each independently, not together, each of their own labs, independently looked and said, no asbestos. It's not the truth. And the FDA, to their credit, also sent this Dr. Lewin samples, this New York scientist who claimed there was asbestos in Baker, out to three independent labs, and they concluded this is the FDA document. There is poor correlation between Dr. Lewin's results and the findings of other investigators. And then they, the plaintiff started to say, oh, well, this is one guy, Dr. Hutchinson, who agreed with Dr. Lewin. He was from the University of Minnesota Space Center. And remember, they asked, Dr. Nicholson about that at length. And then you look at Dr. Hutchinson's report, and you heard from Dr. Hopkins. Dr. Hutchinson was an expert in the testing methodology, SEM. And so McCrone said, test with this kind of microscope, SEM. Uh, and he didn't find anything. He said, oh, I'm going to try TEM too. Well, McCrone and Dr. Cooley were universally respected experts on TEM. They had already done it on TEM and found nothing. 
But Dr. Hutchinson said, I'm going to try it on TV. I mean, even though McComb said, you're the SCM expert, do that. And then he said, oh, it's hectic. And McComb got his report. And they said, Where, this is just notes. Where's your formal report? Where's your backup? Where's your micrographs? Where's your missing information? The best lab in the world like, what's this guy doing? And they're, you know, they, they went after Dr. Lee and said, well, why didn't you send this to the FDA? And McCrone was the one who made the decision that this was a piece of garbage. So McCrone said, here's our TEM results. Here's Dr. Pooley's TEM results. Here are all these third party, MIT, Princeton, other third party results. This is not reliable. And McCrone made the decision that this was not something that should be sent. And when you look at what he did, this guy from the Space Center, Minnesota. 3,000 grids, he said, he looked at in two hours. That's two seconds of the grid. No wonder he messed up. And all of the other TEM testing by the best labs in the world confirmed that Dr. Lewin samples did not have. And then, even better, and I submit to you, and I told you in opening, the best evidence comes from people that have no interest in this. Forget about the plaintiff's experts. Forget about my experts. Look at the people that don't have an interest, right? They're not being paid. The FDA is being paid to protect the public health. And they did their job here. They jumped in. It's best as a baby pattern. Oh my god, of course the FDA is going to jump in. They jumped in and they did their own testing in 1976. And Dr. Lewin, he actually retested too. Remember, he claimed to find chrysotile in shower shower. But when he retested, he said, you know what? Maybe not. I'm not sure now. And the FDA, there's no chrysotile in shower to shower. And the FDA and Dr. Lewin, no chrysotile or asbestos in baby powder at all. Not the technology. And the polarized light microscopy that the FDA used, Dr. Weber acknowledged, their expert knowledge, much more sensitive method than Dr. Lewin. Remember, Dr. Lewin just used X-ray. The FDA used the Polaroid light mic microscope as well as another testing, and they didn't find asbestos. They said there isn't any. And they said, well, that's only a non-detect. Non-detect down to one-tenth of one percent. And you saw this document where the FDA has not identified price file over 200 samples. Good for the FDA. They jumped in and did their own. They weren't going to just take Johnson and Johnson's word for it. They weren't going to take even MIT and Princeton's word. The FDA did their own testing and concluded there's no, there's no truth to this. This was back in the 70s. So why are they resurrecting and trying to repackage and resell it now? The losses. And even their own experts. There's never been price of talent Johnson and Johnson being packaged. Even their own experts. Chrysotile is a bad kind of asbestos. No, uh, and, and even Dr. Attendance, who doesn't think it causes mesothelioma, it causes lung cancer and uh, asbestosis and scarring. And Dr. Longo, he said, I've never found chrysotile in any J and J sample, concentrating, not concentrating, PLM, TEM, any way you look at it, you've never found chrysotile. As I stated yesterday, that is correct. Dr. Compton, you didn't find chrysotile in any of the samples from the top board body. That's correct. And even Dr. Lewin, to his credit, he said, yeah, you know what? There's no asbestos in Johnson's baby powder. He issued a retraction to the Wall Street Journal in 1973. He's never changed that statement. So why are they repackaging and reselling something with a guy who actually did the test said, I was erroneously quoted as having reported that Johnson's powder powder contained 2 to 3% asbestos. I found no evidence of asbestos in nine of the samples. And the other two samples fell into the inconclusive category described above. These results are not seriously at variance with those reported by the testers. I didn't find evidence in nine samples. I couldn't conclude in the other two. I agree with the company to defend it. That was his final statement. He said he was erroneously quoted. And good for him for saying, you know what, I messed up. And maybe he did see Dr. Lewin, although everybody else said it wasn't a sample, but Dr. Weber said it was common in the early 70s to have a stray contaminant of chrysotile because people were using asbestos filters and these microscopes, chrysotile filters. And in fact, you heard he wrote his PhD statement on that, that there could be stray contaminants in the lab of chrysotile because they were part of their microscope filters back in the 70s. 
then you have them, the planets talk about the shower shower G11 issue. But when you actually look at the document, Macron's testing document, it shows that when, you, when they tested the actual shower to shower product, products all seem to be quite clean and we did not find any fibers of the asbestos or materials in any of them. And what they did say is in this additive, in a separate pile of this additive, G11 that was used back in the 60s, uh, there was a, a contaminant. Just like Dr. Weber and Dr. Longo also, you can find this back then because there was asbestos in the filters, you could find a contaminant. But it wasn't in the shower to shower. And then you heard the stipulation of the court read that both parties agreed to that this G11 was not part of the shower to shower formula beyond the second quarter of 1968. No plan in this case unless they use shower to shower, shower to 1989. Only Ms. McNeil is alleging that she used shower to shower in this case, and not until 1989. So what does this whole issue even have to do with this case? When you don't have the testing results, on the product at issue, I submit to you, you reach for innuendo, speculation, allegations without evidence. 